It is really wonderful to be back here on this campus. It has been a while. Uh, it's particularly wonderful to be back here talking about the August Offensive uh, because it was at this institution that I did my PhD and it formed the basis of my book, which you can get for $25 US online. Climax <laughs> um, at Gallipoli, which was just introduced. And there'll be much, um, as much of relevance in this book to the topics that we're discussing today. I'll get that out of the way. The theme that runs through this book is that while the Gallipoli campaign was fought against a different enemy in a different theatre with contrasting terrain and less resources, it was very much like the offensives in style, objectives and results waged on the Western Front. But in all, Gallipoli was not unique. 1915 itself was a year of failed offensives and Gallipoli, a sideshow to the main war, was just another example of this. Almost everything you see happening on the Western Front was happening at Gallipoli, and I'll touch on some of these this afternoon. The purpose of, of this talk is to look at how artillery was to be used doctrinally and how it was being used practically in 1915. And I'll do this through a very brief comparison uh, of what was happening um, at the, in the Battle of Neuve-Chapelle in March of 1915 and the Orbs Offensive at Gallipoli. Picking up on one of the themes of the seminar series, Combined Arms, so an approach that integrates multiple arms to complement each other, I wanted to look at whether Gallipoli was a case study of combined arms of the artillery and infantry, in this case, um, complementing each other, or whether it was a case of supporting the other. And the answer was pretty clear, and it lay in doctrine. Okay, we're working. In 1915, British doctrine and operational theory viewed artillery as an accessory and subsidiary to the infantry rather than an autonomous arm. Its function, as made clear by field service regulations, was, quote, and you can read it here, to assist the other arms in breaking down hostile opposition. The emphasis on assisting tended to mean that fire support had to mould and adapt to the infantry's plans, rather than those plans being developed in accordance with the strengths and, importantly, the weaknesses of the fire, su fire support um, resources available. Indeed, it wasn't until 1917 that the British realised the full potential of their artillery and adapted their planning processes accordingly. The lessons of March 1915 at Neuve-Chapelle, which showed that concentrated fire and a detailed artillery preparation were essential for initial success, were ignored, or at least not even considered, for the August offensive. At Gallipoli, plans developed without due consideration of the firepower situa situation and irrespective of the opinions and concerns of the artillery experts. And then secrecy kept the details of the artillery requirements from the brigade commanders until the day before the offensive. They're not working together here. Many similarities appear if comparisons are made with Neuve Chapelle. In both instances, the 18 pounders were used to destroy the wire entangle entanglements how it's just to fire on trenches and the heavy artillery to bombard uh, distant targets and engage in counter battery fire. The artillery plans were also similar, both containing multiple phases and new roles for the artillery as the offensive progressed. But despite the conceptual similarities of the two offensives, the fire support available for the two was very different. In terms of, uh, don't worry about learning these numbers. In terms of artillery allocation, the proportions of artillery for the August offensive were skewed. They did not match the proportion of troops. Cape Ellers, the least significant of the three sectors of the August offensive, had 36% of the troops and 55.5% of the artillery pieces. Suvla Bay was roughly proportional with 20% of the troops and 17.8% of the artillery. And the Anzac sector, which included the Surrey Bear, uh, range, which is the main objective of this August offensive, had 44% of the troops and only 26.7% of the artillery. In spite of being a smaller operation than the August offensive, there were no, uh, sorry, there were more artillery pieces available than Neuve Chapelle. With approximately 340 artillery pieces to support four divisions, although only three brigades were in the initial attack at Neuve Chapelle. It was 11% in excess of, of establishment. And this is compared to a 13% deficiency using conservative calculations 
at the Dardanelles, which, despite the total number here, had 270 artillery pieces on the peninsula. And that figure there, uh, available for the August offensive, the total figure there, 425, includes pieces that are in the theatre that aren't, uh, so in Egypt, that aren't destined for delivery, <coughs> and also uh, French artillery pieces that in no way, with the exception of 18, were to support the August offensive. On a sector basis, uh, Hellas was largely an establishment with 150 pieces. It had a deficiency of only 3.8%. Suvla with 28 pieces and another 20 at Anzac that are destined to be sent there when they've established the beachhead was substantially worse with a deficiency of 44.2%. Anzac, the main sector, was the worst with 72 pieces and a deficiency of 62.1%. Despite this, the Allies still outgunned the Ottomans, who overall had 163 guns, different calibre, but superiority in numbers didn't uh, necessarily mean superiority in practice. With a frontage of 2,000 yards, or one, one artillery piece for every six yards of trench, Neuve Chapelle had the heaviest concentration of British artillery fire at that time and was not surpassed until 1917. <coughs> this ratio of, ratio of pieces per yard employed during Neuve Chapelle was considered to be an optimal amount. The fire support available for the Hellas operations equated to one piece for every 28 yards of front, a ratio similar to that used on the Western Front later in the year at Luz. At Anzac and Surrey Bear, it was worse with one piece for every 111 yards of frontage, and at Suvla it was absolutely dismal. For the first three days there was one piece for every 833 yards of trench, and it improved later to one piece for every 416 yards. With the example of Neuve Chapelle in mind, from an artillery perspective alone, it's small wonder that the August offensive failed to achieve even the first phase of its objectives. Despite the deficiencies in artillery pieces available in the Dardanelles, it is important to note that the Mediterranean Expeditionary Force and its artillery, as a, a percentage of the total British artillery, was roughly proportional to the total percentage of British troops sent to the Dardanelles. In other words, the Dardanelles represented approximately 7% of both British troops and artillery. The MEF, however, was proportionally lower in terms of heavy, heavy batteries. Of the 93 heavy batteries on all fronts at this time, the four at the Dardanelles accounted for only 4%. For the, for, uh, furthermore, the proportion of personnel to main the MEF's guns was deficient. With an effective strength of just under 10,000 artillery personnel, the MEF's artillery strength represented a mere 3.3% of the total British artillery manpower. Such comparisons show that the MEF was never given adequate resources, whether in troops or guns, for the task that was expected of it. But I will add that the same can be said for the Western Front. Then there was the problems of the guns themselves. Some of these were, uh, were early models, in previous wars were inaccurate and subject to breakdown. I'll give one example of the 10 pounder mountain guns, which dated from the Second Afghan War of 1879, and these were described by one artillery officer as an, as a, an obsolete pattern and hopelessly inaccurate. But it was still in service due to the lack of an alternative. Six of the 12 guns of the 7th Indian Mountain Artillery Brigade, artillery brigade which was deployed to, us to support the, the Anzacs, had to be exchanged before the August Offensive owing to wear. Their replacements from India that, that, ar that arrived were old and worn. But incredibly, four of those discarded pieces were then used to bring the 4th Highland Mountain Artillery Brigade up to strength. There are other examples. The 60-pounders broke down because of problems with the recoils, and the 50-pounder uh, BLCs after a thousand rounds became so bitter that they, they were inaccurate. Now to go back to my point about not considering artillery, artillery limitations, I'll give one example. The idea of the August Offensive, and you can see it here in this map, is to, through various phases, um, get across the peninsula. Take the high ground of the Surrey Bear Ridge, break out from Anzac holding the third ridge, push across the peninsula at the flattest part, and then allow, uh, take out these forts and allow the Navy to sail up through. Dardanelles. We'll talk about what's happening on Gun Ridge there. Second phase to enable the third phase. The idea of that phase is to get the guns up onto the Surrey Bear Ridge, 
and use the fire to cut Ottoman uh, communications and advance across the peninsula. So notwithstanding all the difficulties of actually hitting a target with indirect fire, the fact that the maps were inaccurate, the grid um, references don't actually match up to what's on the ground, and problems with spotting that you would have heard about at the last seminar. There are the following points to make. There's a difficulty of getting the guns into position. One artillery officer who commanded um, uh, uh, the divisional artillery at, uh, for the New Zealand Australian Division believed that it would have required at least 1,000 men to move an 18-pounder up to the Surrey Bear Ridge. But even then, the targets were out of range. The only gun that could hit its targets um, was the 60-pounder. There are only eight on the peninsula, none at Anzac. Weighing four and a half uh, tonnes, moving on the Surrey Bear Ridge would have been impossible. And this problem can be appreciated if we take a comparison with Suvla Bay. In late August, it took 150 men to move two 60-pounders 600 yards on relatively flat ground at Suvla Bay. Yet the average incline was 9.6%, and at its worst, it got to double that. Now, the distance to get the guns up in the Surrey Bay range was four times greater, with an average incline of 12.5%, but increasing to 77%. This was not going to happen. And they were the only guns who could, who could fire the distances required, and that's using the same maps and the range tables that the commanders had available to them at the time. Then there's the tight reliability and accessibility of ammunition, and I'll talk about that in, in my other talk. So like those on the Western Front, the August Offensive represents the very beginning of the development of a new Allied way of fighting in the First World War, and I think that's how it should be examined and, and thought about throughout the process of, of tonight's events. Thank you.